our reading from Isaiah chapter 9, and you'll see in a moment why I, why I want to um, read this, because it sets the context for everything that we're going to talk about. But I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 9, starting um, with verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing upon the earth. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. <coughs> this um, study that we're, that we're using of Walter Bergman's um, is based on Isaiah 9-6 and a particular part of this, so I'm going to read it again. It's based on these four names for the Messiah. The verse reads, For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So in the introduction, um, Brueggemann tells us that um, the early church um, very much revered the Hebrew Scriptures which they came to call eventually the Old Testament because they saw the, um, the advent of Jesus and Jesus' life and teaching as a New Testament of witness to the God of the Israelites. So um, the early church said um, Jesus does neither replace nor deny the expectations of a Messiah previously told in Scripture he fulfills those prophecies. Um, the four royal titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the, uh, this study will ponder each of these four titles, one for each week of our study, and how people understood it then, meaning um, both in the time it was written, in the time of Isaiah the prophet, and also in the early church, which used this scripture to say how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies about Messiah. How Jesus did or did not fulfill the title, and how Christians interpret Jesus as representative of each title. In the witness to Jesus by the early Christians in the New Testament, they relied heavily on the Old Testament anticipations or prophecies of a coming Messiah. But Jesus did not fit these anticipations very well, such that it took a good deal of interpretive imagination, according to Bergman, that's what he calls it. Um, it was required in order to negotiate the connection between the anticipation of a Messiah that was in ancient um, Judah and the actual bodily historical reality of Jesus. So you have two time periods. You have the time period of Isaiah writing in probably like the 7th, 8th century BCE. And then you have the 1st century CE, the early church, the uh, writing of the Gospels, and the beginning of the Jesus movement. 
Um, this oracle, and Brueggemann calls it an oracle in Isaiah, is well known to us because of Handel's Messiah. Could you hear Handel's yeah, Messiah? <laughs> when, when I was reading this, because just about all of this, these um, eight or nine verses mm -hmm. are in the Messiah. Um, it did not anticipate or predict Jesus when it was written. Um, it, it, was, uh, it pertained to the time period when it was written, which was 8th century BCE, the time of Isaiah. It probably pertained specifically toward the, to the coronation of the new king, and the new king at that time was Hezekiah. Um, so it probably referred to Hezekiah being uh, of age, and he was going to be um, coronated, uh, crowned the king of Judah, and so this oracle was was made at that time um, a royal oracle, um, and and it said that it anticipated this new wave of well-being, peace, and prosperity for Judah because they were getting a new king, and aren't we always hopeful? Whenever a new leadership comes in, whether it's leadership in the church or leadership for our state or leadership for our local nonprofit that we're volunteering for or leadership for our country, when new leadership takes over, we're ready to be jubilant with hope about how great things are going to be. Well, it was the same in the time of Hezekiah. Um, this oracle is an extravagant and excessive royal liturgy, says Brueggemann, and probably resembled coronation liturgies in other surrounding countries that would they would have been familiar with, like those in Egypt, when that were probably um, written down and used for the coronation of a new pharaoh. So that really puts it in a historical perspective for us. The oracle anticipates a new regime of peace and prosperity in Jerusalem. A season of great light. Is this, this already sound like Christmas? It should. Um, a great light which is contrasted with darkness of imperial exploitation under the empire of Assyria. So um, at this time in the 8th century, Assyria was the conquering um, country, the conquering army, the conquerors who were coming in. Um, I don't have another one. We're, we're going to share. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Right. Thank you. And so Mary has. Sorry, she's not about this. Okay. okay. Well, we I'm we right down there. we <laughs> just got we just got started ten minutes ago, so you're good. Um, so we're in the section on the first page under Week One, Wonderful Counselor, second paragraph. So we're talking about Assyria. Uh, Assyria was the great conquerors of that time period, so that was the great threat um, for Judah, is that Assyria would um, invade and conquer and um, kick Hezekiah off the throne and maybe replace him with a puppet king or take control of his rule. Um, but when um, Hezekiah is um, crowned king, um, the coming king is anticipated will release Judah from the oppression of these potential conquerors. This oracle anticipates a new regime of endless peace with justice and with righteousness forever. So this is some of the language that you hear in this royal oracle. Um, a great hope. The term counselor in wonderful counselor refers to the exercise of governance, the capacity of a leader to administrate, to plan, and to execute policy. Um, so when you hear um, governance, administer, plan, execute policy, you, you think of a, a leader, someone who is in office, an officer, if you will, who is in charge of uh, a whole program uh, that involves people and activities and such. And so that's what we are to hear when we hear this word counselor. It's like an administrator or leader, if you will. The term wonderful probably um, modifies the noun counselor, suggesting that the new king will have extraordinary wisdom and foresight 
about planning. So we're going to talk about how that applied to Hezekiah, but we're also going to talk about how that applied to Jesus. Um, the actual regime of Hezekiah did enact some remarkable policies, notably withstanding the assault of the Syrian army. Um, Judah was the southern kingdom, Israel was the northern kingdom, and Israel fell to the Syrian invaders. Judah did not. Judah will fall later um, to another invader, but Judah did not fall to the Assyrians. So Hezekiah had that to his credit, that he led his people um, through a, a period of time where they held off the, the threat um, of those Assyrians. Um, in the end, however, the rule of Hezekiah proved to be a disappointment Hezekiah ultimately capitulated to the rising power of Babylon. So I said the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah would fall to the Babylonians. That would be the next great power that would rise and try to take over the area that we know today as, as Israel and Palestine. Perhaps it is inevitable, says Brigham, given the unpredictable nature of historical reality, which means when we write something about the future, we don't know if it's going to come true the way we predict or not. We may have a great hope that it will, but um, we don't know what the future holds. He says such high expectations could not be realized in fact. And probably that's always true. We can have hope for the future. We can write of great longings um, for the future, but we don't know what will actually come about. Um, but he points out once again on page four, there is always new hope when leadership changes. We're always ready, even if we've had a great leader. When a new leader comes in, we have hope that whatever was not perfect in the past leadership will be perfected in the new leadership. And we're usually not concentrating on what's going to go wrong in the new leadership. We don't yet know the weaknesses of the new leader, so we can't yet predict what's going to go wrong um, in, with that one. So we're awfully hopeful. The oracle with the honorific titles for the king, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, was ready at hand for the early church in the first century when it came time to bear witness to Jesus, when they were going to write their record, of their version of the story of Jesus. It was also handy when Handel, many centuries later, <laughs> offered his glorious work of connecting the reality of Jesus to the Old Testament expectation um, of Isaiah. The expected Messiah would be received as a king. So our Christmas carols abound with royal imagery. Think of an example. Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King Sunday. <laughs> but also the, um, the, um, the wise men coming to pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews and the gifts they bring, the um, gold and frankincense and myrrh were um, gifts that would be given to royalty. They're, they're not the gifts that you would bring um, if your neighbor had a baby next door. Um, it, it would be um, the gifts that you would give for a royal birth. As ancient King Hezekiah had to face the Assyrian Empire with its threat, so Jesus came into an ominous political situation that was dominated by the Roman Empire. So when the threat in uh, 8th century BCE, in Hezekiah's time, in Isaiah's time, the threats were Assyrian army and Babylonians in the 1st century, now it's Rome. Rome holds all the power. And so when we say that the Jews and the Jewish Christians of the first century were oppressed, and I said that this morning in my sermon when I talked about um, how the audience of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, 
These Jewish Christians, they identified with the oppressed, with the ones who had no power, the, with the ones who couldn't buy justice for themselves because they didn't have the money, they didn't have the influence, they didn't have the power, they didn't have the friends in high places um, so that they could be uh, assured of justice. Um, so they identified with the least of these. Um, that was also true in the time of the writing of the, the um, Gospels. And the, the big oppressive power was Rome, the empire, um, Caesar, the emperor. Um, that is where the power lay. You may remember that at the time that Jesus was born, um, Herod the Great was the king. Um, and he thought himself powerful, but he was not powerful compared to the Roman Empire. He answered to the Roman Empire, uh, as did later um, Herod that was um, ruling when at the time of um, Jesus' death and Pontius Pilate, the governor, um, they answered to Rome. They, they were leaders, but they were puppet leaders of the Roman Empire. So um, it was Rome that would be the power that um, the early Christians were thinking, <coughs> our Messiah will come and deliver us from the oppressive power of Rome. The larger drama of the gospel exhibits the way in which King Jesus takes issue with the royal power of Rome and subsequently with every regime of power that imagines itself as ultimate and absolute. The power of King Jesus is intrinsically revolutionary and subversive against every repressive regime. So you can apply um, this beautiful sentence that I didn't write, this came directly from um, Brueggemann. Um, you can apply it to the situation of the Jewish Christians under the Roman Empire, but you can also apply it to um, Christians and others over the centuries since any um, oppressed group, people group, whether they were oppressed because of their faith or if they were oppressed because of their legal status, maybe they were slaves or um, they were indentured servants or some other class that was not as um, powerful, influential, um, wealthy as a, a class that was more elite over them. Um, so the power of Jesus is intrinsically revolutionary and subversive. I want to talk a moment and ask you to respond to those two words, revolutionary and subversive. How is Jesus, the Jesus of your understanding, how is his power revolutionary? Physics revolution is a complete turn. Yeah. And social science is the flip from the bottom to the top of the top. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Turning the world upside down. Yeah. Yes. That's pretty hard to Yes. And when we're going to get to some um, of that very language before, before we finish, um, but actually saying um, like the first will be last and it, turning it up, turning it on it, its head turning the um, powers of a society um, on its head, rearranging a power structure. So um, that is how it could be revolutionary. What about subversive? What is your understanding of a power that is subversive? To subvert something means to undermine, to um, to get it at its foundation, to weaken it at its foundation. Um, it would subvert the patriarchy. It's the only way that's honoring and recognizing women in their power. Mm -hmm. Which is the most subversive vision. It is. Parables often were attacking the Pharisees right. and the rulers. Of, 
of Judaism. Right. He basically told the, the Pharisees that he thought their understanding of God was um, uh, sacrilegious um, because um, he said, you, uh, you, your, your interpretation of the law is in your own interest. Um, it's not um, with the, the thought of the people that the law was written to protect and to um, preserve. He was showing their egoism, which was totally against what he was preaching. He was very subversive when he turned over the money. Yes. Yep. Yep. He turned the tables upside down. Yes. Yes. And um, and um, and and strode the coins across the floor as if they were as if, not as if they were nothing, but as if they um, didn't belong there. It, it was very clear. He was saying this power represented by these coins does not belong in this place. So he just. But he also on. said, "Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's." Yeah. In that respect, he might have been supporting a little. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe he was really saying <laughs> that the, the power of Caesar has its place, and its place is represented by Caesar's picture on the coin. So, in the marketplace, can you um, re can you recognize the power of Caesar? Well, yes, because that's how you're going to pay with Caesar's money to buy the food that you need to feed your family. But does it have the same, uh, does it carry the same weight? Does it have the same authority in the temple where you're coming in to um, get a, um, a, a dove or a, uh, a lamb to sacrifice in the worship of God? And I think he was saying, Caesar has his place and it's not here in the temple. Other thoughts about how the power of, of Jesus is subversive? I talked this morning about how in liberation theology it says um, very uh, explicitly that God has a preference for the poor, a preferential option for the poor. Um, so this says subversive against every repressive regime. If a regime is a, a repressive, then there is a repressed, there's a victim there, a victim of repression. And, um, and Jesus would seek to liberate those repressed persons or those people groups that he would say um, they are God's children too. The way he said to um, the woman with the issue of blood, my daughter, your faith has made you well. He lifted her up from a very low status. She would have been an untouchable, uh, a, a, a doubly cursed person because she was female and she had this issue of blood. She was um, a, a, an untouchable and yet she reached out and touched him and he acknowledged her as a living, breathing, worthy child of God. So he, he lifted her up from her very base status to, to a higher status, to an equal status with um, that. Um, he was on his way to heal a daughter of a synagogue ruler someone with a lot of influence in his society, yet Jesus stopped and healed this woman first and let the synagogue ruler wait until, like, wait your turn. He, it was almost as if, um, in the way that the, the Gospels tell the story, it shows you that he brought her up, he brought him down to a common level. That, that we're all equally loved by God. Um, and that is a subversive idea in the first century. It was a very hierarchical society um, with um, 
males generally, um, you know, above females, you know, uh, the women in the temple, there was the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go once a year, and then there was the, the outer chamber from there where the only the priests could go, and then there was the outer chamber from there where only the Jewish men could go, and then there was the um, Gentiles, and then there were the women. And they could, they could only go this far because they didn't have the status to get any closer to where the, they thought God was in the Holy of Holies. Like, that was like the center. That was like the center of where God's spirit dwelt, not just in the temple, but in all of Israel. <coughs> um, so the women, women, you kind of feel like that's, it's a real picture of being marginalized because you don't get close. You're out on the margins of society simply because you're female. But um, also the poor people, the uh, disabled people, whether they were born disabled or became disabled because of illness or injury, they were pushed to the margins. The lepers, you know, couldn't, couldn't come into town. They had to live on the outskirts of town and, and use people who could go back and forth for them to, to bring them um, food and, and clothing and other necessities because they couldn't actually go into a village. They were banned. Um, Wouldn't that make it worse if they did? Or they, they would spread the well, it was thought that they would spread their illness. We believe today that they didn't have any illness that was contagious. But it was thought that um, if you got close to them, if you touched a leprous person, that you would be in, afflicted. Um, so they just erred on the, the side of caution and said, you can't come in. So they literally lived on the outskirts of society. So when you think of, we talk about marginalized people today, um, they were physically marginalized, out on the margins, um, like the women um, in the temple. That's making me think of all the kingdom of God sex, like the yeast one, because wasn't that really looking at unity? And that would have been subversive because the powerful people didn't want unity. No, they didn't want to come to a wedding feast and sit with, um, you know, a, a, a peasant beside them at the table. That would have been an offense um, to them, to their status. Um, they couldn't see why Jesus would sit down and have um, table fellowship with um, tax collectors because tax collectors were marginalized because they had to deal with the peasants and collect money from them. They had to touch the coins that the peasants' hands had touched. So they were not allowed into polite society. A Pharisee wouldn't have sat down with a tax collector and shared a meal, but Jesus did. Um, and with the... Um, you know, he touched the blind people, and he touched the um, the lame people, and the blind, and the Pharisees would not have done that. Um, the Pharisees were the kind of people who would have walked by the um, the man who was um, robbed and left by the side of the road that the Good Samaritan eventually helped. The Pharisees were kind of like the people who came around him and didn't get close to him because they saw that he had blood on him. And they did not want to um, be contaminated by his blood. So they gave him a wide berth and walked around and walked on. So that was kind of the Pharisees. They thought that God looked on that as righteousness. And that's how Jesus said to them, that's no righteousness. You've corrupted the idea of a righteous God because a righteous God loves everybody the same. And they were completely offended by that idea. Um, for the early church, Isaiah's oracle provides both eloquence and substantive guidance for discerning the new rule of Jesus. 
The general claim of the oracle is that a new regime of peace and well-being will displace the older Roman order of violence and extortion. And on top of violence and extortion, I'll say exploitation. Because uh, a, a repressive power like Rome would come in and exploit every resource they, they see in your community. Because they can. Because that's why they conquered you. Is so they could come in and exploit your resources. And if they needed to use violence or extortion in order to do that, then that was quite all right with them. Um, then it says, let us consider Jesus' role as wonderful counselor, as an agent of extraordinary plans and policies for the ordering of public life of his people. I'm right in the middle of the second page, um, right before the numbered <coughs> list starts. Number one, Jesus was wise. Jesus astonishes his contemporaries by his capacity to see and act beyond conventional assumptions. Um, numerous times in the Gospels, it says that the scribes and the Pharisees would come and they would listen to his teaching and they would say, where is he getting this? Um, where was this man educated? Because we haven't heard teaching like this, and he and he says it as if he it has authority behind it, and yet we don't know where he's getting this, so how can it have authority? Um, they, they questioned um, him because he surprised them. His teaching surprised them, and they couldn't figure out um, what its basis was. Number two, Jesus is extraordinary. Jesus' teaching confounded the authorities. He engaged the powerless crowds, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman who was bent over, the woman at the well, so many women, the Canaanite woman, but also um, the blind man, the lame man, the... Um, the, the man who was paralyzed and brought to Jesus by his four friends who carried him on a sheet. Um, Jesus engaged with powerless crowds as he articulated a world under alternative governance that did not conform to old patterns of abuse and exploitation. I, I think what's important there is Jesus was laying out a, a, a society where the classes... Um, weren't shaped like this, but was shaped like this, with God as the power at the top and all of us on a level under God, all looking up to God, not having to look through um, that next level, the class level above us, and then the one above that, and then the one above that, and the one above that, um, but all of us looking directly up at God. Jesus is wise beyond explanation. For that reason, he constitutes an immense threat to conventional learning and conventional power. He is wonderful in his teaching because he opens up new possibilities that were thought to be impossible. Possibilities that would override and displace all present power arrangements and all current distribution of resources. Um, Poor people in Jesus' day didn't expect to receive the best of anything. They didn't expect to receive an education. They didn't expect that their children would be given the opportunity for an education. They didn't expect to, um, to rise to the next hierarchical level above them. If they were a, a, pe a, a peasant farmer, they didn't expect to become a merchant. If they were a merchant, they didn't expect to become a tax collector. If they were a tax collector, they didn't expect to become a scribe um, because there were limitations that kept you at the level where you were born. Um, so your, um, your class was your class. There was no step up to become something better by working hard or um, getting the right kind of education or getting mentored by the right kind of mentors. 
um, there was no expectation of that. But the closest thing in our world, although not as much today, be a caste system. Mm -hmm. Probably. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yes. Um, but also think of the African American slaves in the 1700s and the early 1800s. Um, they didn't expect to get an education. Um, they didn't expect to be freed in their lifetimes, especially in the 1700s. Um, and remember, there had been slaves in the colonies since the 1600s. Um, so um, they, they were people that didn't expect to be able to rise above their station. So in Jesus' time, the poor people, the um, disfigured people, um, there was a man who, well, le lepers, but there was also an, a man whose hand was withered. It had probably been crushed in an accident and um, the muscles were atrophied, um, and so it was unusable. It was like an unusable limb, and Jesus healed it and made it whole. And the Pharisees um, jumped on him for having done that because he did it on the Sabbath. And um, they basically said, how dare you heal him on a Sabbath day and, and, right, and have the gall of you to do it right here in the synagogue. Um, you know, you're, you're uh, an abomination because you've done this thing. And Jesus said, if your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, don't you, you know, get your neighbor to help you. You pull it out. You bring relief to the ox. Why would you not bring relief to this child of God who is, has suffered this horrible disfigurement? So Jesus was all about... Um, leveling things out and distributing resources differently so that people could expect that they might rise above their current circumstances, that their children might rise above the family's current circumstances so that they could have hope that um, whatever the, the suffering in their current circumstances, that things could be better. Um, I don't think that there's anything sadder than a people who live day to day with no hope. With no hope that things will ever be better for themselves, for their loved ones, mm -hmm. for their children, for their grandchildren. Compassion International says that's the lie of poverty. That there is no hope. That they'll never be better. Yeah. That there's no chance, there's no yeah. possibility. And so Jesus came preaching possibilities. That, um, that in his, um, the society that he was teaching into um, said, well, it's impossible. But Jesus said, no, it's possible. And I'm going to tell you about a kingdom where people live on a level under God. Where things are different, where people behave differently and where God is the shepherd of all the sheep, such that if one goes missing, Jesus would risk all the others, or God would risk all the others to find the one, because that one is important, is just as important as all those other 99. Uh, number three, Jesus' teaching and actions display inexplicable wisdom. The old limits of the possible have been exposed as fraudulent inventions designed to keep the powerless in their places. Jesus violates such invented limitations and opens the world to the impossible. He is the teacher of possibilities, the bringer of new possibilities. Um, in so doing... Jesus becomes the threat to the established order. Jesus is seen by the powerful elite of his day to be dangerously subversive because he challenges and contradicts all normal assumptions, what they consider normal. Jesus challenges those things. This is a king who refuses to accept conventional options of governments. Indeed, he inverts power arrangements just as his mother Mary anticipated when she sang these words before he was born. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, 
He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. And for you um, music musicians, you will recognize that as the Magnificat, the Song of Mary. <clears throat> the authorities rightly perceive that Jesus' transformative capacity in subversive teaching and revolutionary action entailed the end of their dominance. So, because they began to see, okay, our society is built like this, and here we are near the top, and Jesus wants to do this. And they said, we can't have this. He's dangerous. He is, he's preaching something to the people that if it were implemented, would do away with our control. And no leader in control wants to just give away their power. Power is not given away willingly very often. Uh, we have a, a, I won't say a unique system, but although when we, when our forefathers put the, our system of governments in place in 1776 and thereafter, um, they were building something that was new. Where, um, where ideally it was seen as a level plane, where um, the citizen in rural Connecticut um, was of equal importance to the one who um, advised President Washington about how to um, set policy for um, relations with foreign governments. In, in our system of governments, governance, those, those two people are the same. They're of equal status. That was something new and revolutionary when our forefathers put it in place. Um, and yet Jesus was preaching that kind of, of level, um, egalitarian society is what we would call it today, um, he was preaching that 2,000 years ago. The charge against Jesus was that he was perverting the people, talking them out of their allegiance to entrenched order. So, um, you know, since their earliest um, memory, they had given their allegiance to the only society that they knew, which was uh, a hierarchy. And they might be down here at the elbow of that hierarchy, but they didn't question it because it's it's all they knew. It's all they could imagine. And Jesus invited them to imagine something different um, where they could have an equal status with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the governor and even the emperor um, because we're all children of God. Uh, number five, Jesus invited his followers to continue his mission. Um, before Jesus finishes, this wise, transformative king, in quotation marks, will summon his followers to continue his way of subversive astonishment and transformation in the world. The apostles who witness to this transformative, life-giving power of Jesus are indeed called before the authorities they, like Jesus, turn the world upside down. So the Jesus movement begins in the first century, um, where it, it's well, it begins when there are still people alive who walk with Jesus. Peter and Paul, certainly. I mean, not Paul, but Peter and um, James, his brother. I knew there was another one, um, if not others but at least those two. Um, and then finally, um, I couldn't help but just record this last paragraph as it came from the book because this, Brueggemann is a brilliant um, writer um, and he does such a good job um, in this last paragraph, paragraph. I just had to give it to you as, as he gave it at the end of the chapter. 
The recognition of this new king constitutes a new vocation. It is not only an acknowledgement of his new rule in the world, but a recruitment for action congruent with the new regime. The increase of his government will not be by supernatural imposition or by royal fiat. Instead, it will come about through the daily intentional engagement of his subjects, who no longer subscribe to the old order of power and truth that turns out to be, in the long run, only debilitating fraudulence. It requires an uncommon wisdom to inter interrupt the foolish practice of business as usual. <coughs> Jesus came to interrupt the foolish practice of business as usual in and among the Jews of Palestine, Galilee, Jerusalem, you know, all the, Samaria, the, and um, uh, Tyre and Sidon, you know, all the places that he went. He went preaching a, a new order of things um, and a different understanding of God and what God wanted from us and what God considered righteous. All the Jesus has all these revolutionary ideas about God that don't fit with the ideas of the ruling elite. Um, I heard something recently, um, and we will tell you what to think. Um, <laughs> it was like um, I can't remember who it was. A, commentary on, on somebody, oh, I know what it was. It was a, um, an interview I, I watched on, um, on the news this past week. And um, they were talking about um, a um, authoritarian regime. Um, think um, any um, dictator in the world today or a dictator that you know about. We'll, we'll just say Putin because he's, um, he's a we. We can all agree Putin's a dictator, and um, and President uh, Xi in um, China, um, his his people took offense when our president said, "Yeah, he's a dictator." And, I mean, if you look at the definition of dictator, he fits it. Uh, <clears throat> it yeah. Um, so, yeah, an authoritarian regime is like um, we're going to tell you what you need to know. We're going to decide what the truth is, and then we're going to tell you, and you're going to accept that. And if you come up with other ideas, don't say anything about them, because we might come and arrest you, because what you say may be a threat to our rule. So that was kind of the, um, the society, the shape of the society that Jesus was born into. Think dictatorship. And, um, and then think the opposite of that. Think, you know, what George Washington and um, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson sat around saying, they didn't, they, Washington said, you can't call me a king. And, and I don't want kingly authority. I'm not going to have kingly authority. They, they were like, well, what are we going to call you? And they went through all these different names. And he said, no, 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 no. And finally he said, well, just call me president because I will preside over the government, government for a certain period of time. And then someone will take my place, someone that's duly elected, and then that person will preside so you can call me president. Well, the term president at the time when he said, yeah, you can call me that, um, was not a, a term of authority. It was just like uh, the, what we would maybe administrator. Um, I work at another church uh, on Monday and I do the books and I'm called a financial administrator. It's a glorified name for a secretary. I'm their financial secretary. That's what I would have been called 40 years ago, you know, before they the term secretary kind of fell out of um, vogue and they said, no, it will say administrator. <coughs> um, but it doesn't mean that I have power. Well, president 
didn't carry the connotation of having power. It was just someone who presided over a meeting. 250 years almost later, the term president has a very different connotation because now we think of it as a powerful position. But when Washington accepted it, that wasn't the case because he was thinking that he was thinking of a society that looked like this, where even the leader didn't have any kind of royal um, trappings including his title. Um, so it's 7.15 and I, we all thought we would probably finish around seven, but what, what do you have? That's all I have. What do you have to say? What, what sparked your interest about this? Well, I, I got the impression that I was just looking at it and I read the and our country, when it was founded, started uh, to make it level. Yeah. And, uh, and eventually, the war and things like that, and free the slaves. And Gave women the vote. Well, that was. You're in the became more socialized, giving tax money to the capital people instead of just operating together. Well, but, but women were given the vote. I mean, that it, it may have happened close to the mm -hmm. same time, but women just were elevated to the same level as men when men already had the vote and women didn't they were on this lower substrata yeah. well when women got the vote it's like our voice was equal to the to the men and when women could be elected to office and we could um you run for congress and we could speak on the floor of the house of representatives and when a woman could be elected as speaker of the house and then when a woman could be elected to the senate and when a woman could be elected to vice presidency, you know, all of these um, firsts have elevated women from the substrata up to the to the level where men have been all along. And um, and it's the same thing with African Americans, and it will be the same thing next with um, people of um, Hispanic background and it and um and muslims you know because we have a lot of muslims in this country and now they are in um positions of power you know they're in the congress and they're in the senate and um they're um you know holding other offices um across our country and um in um european countries i believe the I don't know what his title is. Um, Scotland. The head office in Scotland is a Muslim man. Uh, in, in, in England, uh, the prime minister is of Hindu entry. He's Hindu. Okay, but I'm thinking. I think I'm thinking. Oh, Ireland. Is it Ireland? Okay. Anyway, um, so you know, as time goes by, um, the substrata is is being raised up to um, the level where um, white European men have been since our since we were in the, the colonies. I'm sorry, that thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not true. So I always think you know, the, the first person elected president in Act 1 and got the vote was Warren G. Harding. The Coolidge and Hoover, they weren't exactly good for the state in that sense. So going back to church history, um, it, it saddens me to think that Jesus did so much good work and then the church came along and just flipped it. Once, once the organized church 
organized <laughs> and became hierarchical. There we go. <laughs> um, and and we really haven't gone that far away from this in terms of the Catholic Church. Um, but the Protestant Reformation yes. said you don't have to go through the priest. Right. You don't have to go through the church. Um, it introduced the idea of the priesthood of all believers. So it, right. it kind of took this yeah. in, in the ideal and said it's this. Now, they did have to figure out a way to um, govern the church, and they created hierarchies. Um, but, um, but it was a revolutionary idea, mm -hmm. um, and it reformed the church. Um, so here we are 500 years later, and the church, again, is undergoing reformation. Um, hopefully, um, again, we will take the ideals of Jesus and take structures that look like this and make them like this. Uh, I talked this morning about dismantling racism. Um, racism is, is part of this uh, idea of a hierarchy where you have um, a certain races that are higher on the hierarchy and other races are, you know, are down here and down here and, and down here. And um, so dismantling racism is a way of taking a hierarchical structure and making it flat. Well, I'm a little bothered. I don't know that we want to take all hierarchical <laughs> structures and make them flat. I'm, I'm thinking of the way I heard it put. There is equality in essence, but hierarchy in function. Yes, yeah, I agree. And I think it's easy, where it's in conversation, it's easy to sort of, you know, want to dismantle all hierarchies and, you know, celebrate um, uh, all the qualities. It, it, the purpose of the hierarchies is what counts. Right. Right. Thing. And, that hierarchy of function, and we have to, they have to be, you know, leaders in different, you know. Yes. You have to have a system. Yeah. You, you have to right. have you know, an organization. You have to have an organization, you have to have order. And within that, there is not equality. But the purpose of that hierarchy of function is to serve the equality, the essential equality of everybody involved. Yes. Um, or something like that. The problem is when it becomes inherited. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? When it becomes inherited. When the, I'm uh, important, yes. I'm part of the hierarchy because my daddy was. <laughs> so that, that's when it starts getting me the problem. Because that's, that's, that's when you have a privileged class. And that's yeah. when you're equating the function with the essence. Yeah. Or, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying it will, but you, you can see what I'm trying, yeah. to, trying to say. We have to be careful. Well, okay, let's look at the Presbyterian Church and the, the way that we are governed. Yes, there is a hierarchy. Um, it's not just like the um, Catholic hierarchy, but we do have a hierarchy. But um, what we do is everybody on the lowest level elects representatives to go to the um, next level to make decisions. And then the people who are on this level, they elect representatives to go to the next level to make decisions up here. And the same thing goes up. And so, and there's not a person at the top. There is a, what we call a council at the top, but it's a group of elected representatives. So, um, and they're always changing. You don't, it's not, you don't get elected for life. You get elected for a term. So you serve on a council and then you roll off and you fall off the hierarchy and somebody else <laughs> comes on. And so you don't get entrenched power in individuals. Right. Um, you don't get entrenched influence. And the people from at all levels are still having their voices heard because they get a vote in electing the representatives. Exactly. But... The, the the business of the hierarchy of function also has to do with, it's like a hierarchy of capability. You can't just elect anybody to do anything. Right. You know, that's, so it comes from the innate ability of a person to do that job. Yes. And 
the equality in essence is everybody needs the chance to develop their capabilities to make their unique contribution to the whole. But if we just said, well, we, you know, everybody's equal, so we just put these people up there to do this job, there's other chaos. Other yeah. So that's, I'm just, let's say there I don't mean to be everybody to is to equally loved by God and considered important. Yes. So each life matters. So you, you can't say, okay, you imagine um, the story of the Good Samaritan and the people who are coming along the road and they, they look at the poor guy in the ditch and they say, he looks like a peasant. His clothes, you know, don't look, they're not as good as my clothes. So they make a decision based on their judgment of his worth. And, well, and in our that's society... That's a violation of equality of essence. Yes. In essence, everyone is equal as a child. Right. right. And each life so, is important. And that's the result of imposing, you know, some sort of notion. But the, see, the, the Pharisees didn't didn't see it that way. They they would have um, they would have justified, um, you know, looking at a person and saying he's not of much value, so I'm not going to bother to save his life. And they would have said that that was okay. Mm -hmm. And the, and in the way that we think, that's not okay because based on an equality of essence, you you. You don't have people in those positions. I mean, well, we do. I mean, there are those errors in our society. You know, because based on a, an equality of essence is inherently democratic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we put it that way. Yeah. And so, you know, we do look at, you know, who's, who's capable, or ideally we look at who's capable to do what and we put them in that higher. Right, we elect them. We elect. And we elect them for a certain term so that um, so that the system is always being refreshed. Because you don't want to get entrenched power and have somebody at the top or at a high level and say, um, you know, I, um, I deserve to be there because my daddy sat in that <coughs> seat. You, yes. you, you don't want to get that kind of entrenched power. Yes. All I'm saying is, is I, think, I think it's good to look at to look at those concepts without a value judgment. It's like there's nothing wrong with her. Right. You have to have the right kind of her. Right. You know, kind of her. Right. You know? And there's you know nothing inherently great about the quality of essence. We, we look at it in a certain. You have to look at it for what it really is. I said I was coming. There's a, there's a um, scripture that I love in Ezekiel 34, and I think Malaya read some of it um, this morning when she read from Ezekiel. And um, it talks about how um, God is um, he's criticizing the kings of, um, of Ezekiel's time, and he's saying that they were not good kings because they didn't serve the people. They served themselves. They um, ate of the fat of the land and, um, and the people that they were put there to serve got the scraps. And so he was gonna replace those kings and put good kings um, in their place who would be good shepherds of um, the sheep of God's pasture that they would um, see to the welfare of the sheep rather than to their own welfare. So a, um, a God was um, not going to tear down the hierarchy. He wasn't going to get rid of the uh, office of king. He was going to put someone in that place who could do that job well so that the welfare of the people would be considered. So it, he wasn't condemning the hierarchy. So that's a good case in point that says hierarchy is good. And um, also a, a story that goes way back to the time of Moses, um, where Moses was trying to be the judge of all the people's problems. And his father-in-law Jethro came to him and said, Moses, you need a system 
where the um, the small problems are handled out where they're occurring and only the big problems come to you. So he said, assign leaders of tens and leaders of hundreds and um, and then so that um, you all, not all the problems are coming to you, but only the most important unsolvable problems get to come to you. And so he was, he, Jethro had envisioned a hierarchy with, with a judgment of um, justice with Moses at the top, but said, you know, all these, all these small problems can get judged at near the bottom of the pyramid. So that's a good point. Hierarchies are not intrinsically bad. It's just that um, it, it, it's, it's like a regime. A, a, a regime is not intrinsically bad. A regime is bad if it's repressive. It needs to serve the essential equality of all people. Yes. That's it. They need to be in balance. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming thank out. You. And next Sunday, we'll start at 5, and we'll try to be done at 6 um, so that you can all get home um, and have um, a supper that's not late. <laughs> <laughs>